This video is the first in a series dedicated to salt damage in porous materials. It describes how and under what circumstances the growth of salts in such materials can cause them to degrade. Salt damage is one of the most important weathering mechanisms for monument and sculptures made of stone or brick. But it also affects cementitious materials in a variety of ways. The underlying mechanism of salt damage is crystallization pressure, which we already introduced as one of the mechanisms through which the freezing of water can damage porous materials. Crystallization pressure is a thermodynamically driven process with undercooling as driving force for ice and supersaturation for salts. Let us consider a salt crystal in equilibrium with a solution. The solution then has an ionic concentration such that the energy state of those ions is the same in the solution as in the crystal. For crystal AA, B, B, the solubility product Q is the activity of A to the power small a times the activity of B to the power small b. For dilute solutions, activities can be approximated by molar concentrations, which are denoted with square brackets. For a reminder on this, please view our video on chemical thermodynamics. The value of Q at equilibrium is called the solubility constant and most often noted K. The equilibrium situation should be understood as dynamic, with ions occasionally escaping from the crystal into the solution and ions from the solution colliding with the crystal and being captured. At equilibrium, the rates of both those processes are equal. If more ions are added into the solution, shown in yellow for illustration purposes, the solution is then supersaturated and Q over K is larger than 1. The extra salt raises the frequency of collision and capture of ions from solution without changing the rate of escape from the crystal, which is only a function of temperature. So, the extra ions are gradually captured and equilibrium is restored so that Q over K returns to unity. If the solution is undersaturated, the escape rate is again unchanged, but the capture rate decreases, causing the solid to dissolve. As this happens, the solution concentration increases and the system moves back to equilibrium. The supersaturation needed for a crystal to grow can easily be obtained in a lab by mixing two solutions, each with a soluble salt, respectively with the anion and cation needed to form the crystal. In field conditions, supersaturation is rather produced by loss of water through evaporation, temperature changes, which change the solubility of the salt, reaction of a crystal with ingressing solution and or diffusing ions, transformation from one phase to another, mostly through a coupled dissolution and precipitation. The precipitation of a salt crystal through any of those mechanisms may involve an increase or decrease in the total volume of solids, but that does not control the damage. In particular, in the formation of hydrates, the product is larger than the reacting solid, which easily leads to incorrectly concluding that this change in volume causes the damage. Rather, it is the growth of the crystal driven by supersaturation of the solution that allows the salt to exert stress on the pore walls with potentially destructive results. Going back to our crystal in a supersaturated solution, let us imagine surrounding it with a semi-permeable membrane allowing us to squeeze the crystal without preventing the exchange of ions or water between the crystal and the solution. By pressing on the crystal, its energy state increases, making escape more favorable. A new equilibrium is reached in which the crystal under pressure is in equilibrium with a higher concentration where the rates of capture and escape are again in balance. The solution is supersaturated for an unstressed crystal so that Q is larger than K, implying that an unstressed crystal would grow in such a solution. 
the supersaturation Q over K in equilibrium with a stressed crystal is related to the applied pressure P and is given by RT over VC times the natural logarithm of Q over K, where VC is the molar volume of the salt crystal, R is the ideal gas constant, and T is the absolute temperature. As an example, for sodium chloride, with a molar volume of 27 cubic centimeters per mole, a supersaturation of 10%, giving Q over K to be 1.1, would lead to a pressure of 9 megapascals at 25 degrees Celsius. That is, a pressure of 9 megapascals would have to be imposed on a sodium chloride crystal to prevent it from growing in a solution with a supersaturation of 1.1. Crystallization pressure essentially corresponds to that pressure. It is developed when a crystal tries to grow in a supersaturated solution present in porous medium, but encounters some kind of resistance to its free growth, such as a pore wall. Similarly to freezing, this may involve crystal growth in small pores, typically below about 100 nanometers in radius, filling of a large pore linked to a smaller pore supplying a supersaturated solution, kinetic limitations inhibiting unrestrained growth outside of the material or in large pores not yet filled by the crystals. As an example of the latter point, a crystal growing harmlessly at the mouth of the pore tends to consume the supersaturation of the solution in the pore and thereby suppress the growth of crystals in the interior. However, if the diffusion path is long, the internal crystal may exert damaging stress on the pore wall before the excess ions diffuse to the surface. Similarly, a stressed crystal in a small pore tends to dissolve and feed growth of an unrestrained crystal in a larger pore, but stress may develop in the smaller pore while the transport process occurs. As for the growth of ice, crystallization pressure leads to tensile forces in the host matrix. Thus, materials with low tensile strength in the range of a few megapascals, such as stone, brick, and concrete, are particularly vulnerable to crystallization pressure. Also similarly to ice, the tensile stress felt by the material increases with the volume fraction of crystals exerting pressure. So any removal of salt should be beneficial in cases where damage is happening. In stone and brick, salts are most often supplied from an external source, such as capillary rise of groundwater, or, particularly in coastal regions, aerosols. In such cases, salts are supplied as a solution that gets concentrated by evaporation, either continuously or cyclically from changes in atmospheric conditions. If the solution becomes supersaturated, salts may grow within the pores. This is called subfluorescence and is not visually detectable apart from any damage it may cause. If salts grow on the surface of the masonry, we have efflorescence. Contrary to subfluorescence, it does not damage the stone, but is visually detectable. For given conditions of supersaturation, it will require a certain time for enough salts to accumulate in the pores of a material so that the tensile stress they generate in the material exceeds its tensile strength. From this perspective, we can consider that there is an accumulation stage which will depend on transport conditions, deposition rates, and so forth. At some point, damage may initiate, but it may take some time to reach a critical level, one where the stress exceeds the tensile strength. Should such situations be reached, one may aim to remove salts or reduce the supersaturation by changing exposure conditions to limit the propagation of damage. Prior to this, in the accumulation stage, the main factor one may act upon is to limit the rate at which salts are supplied. This can involve preventive measures, such as limiting ingress of groundwater, aerosols, or fast drying.
In the propagation phase, consolidation treatments may also be considered to restore strength or at least cohesiveness. However, it is generally accepted that these treatments should not block transport of water as this can enhance the risk of freezing damage as well as promote subfluorescence at the expense of efflorescence. The extraction of salts by poultacin is effective but quite labor-intensive and therefore realistically only to be considered for objects of particular significance. In conclusion, the growth of salt in porous materials can be damaging when this occurs under conditions of sufficient supersaturation. For a given supersaturation, damage increases with the amount of salts exerting pressure on the host material and with a decreasing tensile strength of the material. For conservation interventions in the damage propagation stage, salt removal and reduction of supersaturation would be valid interventions. When replacing masonry elements by new stones, delaying the transport of salt should be the key concern when selecting those materials.